Gavin and Matthias show how one might a large project in Rust rewrite. Start out small, let it grow until stealing the show from whatever was there before, right? That's an excellent introduction. <laughs> so I'm Gavin uh, Mendel Gleason. I'm the CTO for Terminus TV. And I wanted to talk a little bit today about Rust as a foundation in a polyglot development environment. So first, I'm just going to give a little outline of the talk uh, as uh, with the motivation, challenges, and solution. So initially, our motivation, I'm gonna, I'll talk about our problem space and why we switched to Rust, and then some of the challenges we encountered and the solutions that we uh, used in order to use Rust as a foundation in our environment. So uh, first, you have to know a little bit about our problem. So we're an in-memory collaborative revision control graph database. Uh, so we have fairly specific requirements uh, and we, we have slightly unusual features. So, and that has driven some of the tool chain requirements that we have. Our software is also, it's a very uh, polyglot house. So we, we're, we have clients written in JavaScript and in Python. We have Rust and we have Prolog, which is somewhat unusual in the modern day. Um, so we also, there's actually also C and C, or yeah, there's also C involved there as well. So some of the unusual features that drive our design uh, requirements. So we're an in-memory database. So that's, uh, that enables faster query. Uh, it's also simpler to implement, and I, I have some experience in implementing um, on ACID databases, uh, and so I know a lot about um, the difficulties that you can encounter when trying to uh, do, uh, you know, paging. So uh, we chose this time to, to, to leave it in memory for the simplicity of design and performance. We are, however, also ACID, so we use a backing store. It, we're not... Um, we're, we, uh, we actually write everything to disk, but uh, we, we leave things in memory. So uh, we also use the sync data structures, and these are, these are unusual data structures that approach the information theoretic minimum size uh, while still allowing query over the data structure. And so this allows us to get really, really large graphs uh, in, our, in, our, in, in memory simultaneously. But this requires a lot of bit twiddling. So they're relatively complicated data structures, and uh, they're they're very compact. But they also they're not so transparent to the developer. Uh, so you, you really need to be able to do effective bit twiddling, uh, which of course is where Rust comes in. So we also have a bunch of Git-like features. So we have revision control, uh, we have push, pull, uh, clone, and all of the things that you know from Git. We do those on databases. So that also drives a lot of our requirements. Uh, we have a data log query engine, and we also have complex schema constraint management. So first, why did we look into Rust in the first place? Uh, so we were not initially a Rust house. We didn't have any Rust in our, in our development at all. Uh, I didn't come from a Rust background. And although I have a lot of um, uh, experience in different programming languages, Rust was not one of those programming languages. So our earliest prototype is actually in Java. Um, it was hard to write, and it had mediocre performance. And so I started prototyping something in Prolog. And the ability to write it in Prolog, actually, because it is, it was very logical, especially the schema checking parts of it, uh, it was extremely fast for us to write it in Prolog. However, it had poor performance. So uh, obviously, it's not the best uh, for bit twiddling. Um, Later, we moved to a library in C++ called uh, HDT, and we used that as our storage layer. And that radically improved the uh, performance of the application. However, uh, we had a lot of trouble with this, and it was a persistent uh, source of pain. So C++ was crashing regularly. And this is partly because we, we needed, we had requirements that meant that we had to be uh, multi-threaded for performance reasons. Uh, because we were dealing with very, very large graph databases in the in the billions of nodes. Um, and the code was not uh, re-entrant, although it was supposed to be. It was written with the intent of being re-entrant. It wasn't in practice. And this would come up uh, when the server crashed. And it was really, really hard to find the source of these crashes. Uh, and that, that was a persistent source of pro problems for us. So 
Then there was a secondary problem, which is that HTT was not designed uh, for write transactions. So it was really designed for data sets and not databases. So we were using extra orchestration logic on top of it to actually use where we would uh, journal transactions and stuff like that in order to make it so that it could be a transactional database, but it wasn't designed that way. So we had feelings about what the interface should be for a library. HTT wasn't it. Um, and it also had these these uh, crashing problems, and we were finding it hard to to find the source of them. So Matthias, off his own bat, went out and wrote a pro prototype in Rust of the succinct data structures that we needed to replace HTT and sort of um, a, like a simple library around it. Uh, and it looked really very promising. Um, so I had not, I had heard of Rust, but I hadn't actually written anything in Rust. Uh, and so th this really drove me to take a look at Rust. And Rust, like I know a lot of languages. I've, I've learned uh, OCaml, C++, you know, uh, Haskell, um, Prolog, uh, Lisp. You know, I've been through a, the gamut of all of these. And I, I don't usually try to learn a new language unless there's something really peculiar that drives it as, as something that you might need uh, in your toolkit. And Rust really had this, this kind of incredible um, aspect to it, which is this, this, uh, the ability to avoid uh, memory problems while still being extremely low level uh, programming language. So thread safety was one of our major headaches that we had reentrance headaches. We were getting seg faults and, and this was a problem and we were finding it difficult and time consuming to sort them out. And this library was exhibiting none of these problems. Uh, so this is this was really promising, and we decided, you know, we were just going to take the plunge and rewrite the foundations of our system uh, in Rust. So, and it also gave us the chance to re-engineer our data structure, simplify code, improve uh, fitness for purpose, change the low-level primitives, and cater to writing to write transactions in particular but also enabled us to do uh, some performance enhancements uh, that we would like to have done, uh, but we're afraid to do because in C++ there's this, there's kind of a fear factor where if you add anything new, you might add something that causes it to crash. So of course, in terms of challenges, uh, I'm sure everyone in the Rust community knows about challenges of FFI. So I don't want to belabor the point, uh, but we, we had an interface with C because we had a prologue implementation that was written in C, so it had a comfortable interaction with C stack. Uh, and this is uh, annoying because if we're in interfacing with Rust, we're actually interfacing it with it through a C FFI. And that kills some of the nice guarantees that you get from Rust, um, but at least they're isolated to the, to the um, interaction surface rather than uh, completely. So we also ended up trampolining through a light C shim, uh, and this is probably not the best approach. We're, we're evaluating a much more direct approach currently. Uh, so I won't uh, try to tell everybody we we've done it right. We've done some things right, but uh, I think we, we can improve a lot here. Now, what we would really like though, is a Rust uh, prolog, because then we could have a nice clean Rust FFI and everything would be uh, beautiful and perfect. Now there's some, progress being made on Scryer Prolog, which is a, a prolog written in Rust with a lot of very cool uh, features uh, that, that you should go look at if you're interested in a, a Rust uh, prolog project. So then some of the challenges that we ran into, I'd like to go through really quickly. So we initially expected to write a lot more of the product in Rust. So we started off um, replacing the HTT layer and then we expected to write a lot more uh, from the ground up. So it's essentially, it's like we had this building, we went in, we replaced the foundations, and then we were going to start replacing the walls. So unfortunately, developer time constraints has favored uh, a different approach for us. Um, so we, we're doing rapid prototyping uh, in Prolog. We essentially, we write the kind of feature that we're interested in there, and then uh, instead of just uh, immediately going to Rust from there, we actually wait. So 
we're much more selective about what we put into Rust uh, than we had initially imagined. And partly, this is due to the learning curve of borrow checking semantics, meaning that it, there's there's a difficulty in getting our developers to understand how this stuff works. So that takes some time, and it, it, there is a high upfront cost here. Uh, and you win it back. Uh, and if you're replacing C++, you win it back very quickly. You win it back very quickly because seeking out those bugs dominates in terms of time. Uh, so that upfront learning uh, cost is nothing compared to the cost of some horrible seg fault that you can't find. Uh, but if you're replacing Prolog, uh, the, the sort of amortized costs are more important. So you're going to have to worry about where you replace it uh, and you have to be more careful about that. Once you've gotten the, the knack of the borrow checker, things go a lot faster. However, they're still slower than writing prolog because you just have to worry about more things in Rust than you do. It's a lower level language, uh, which is why we use it, but it's also uh, it's why we don't always use it. So our solution really has been a late optimization approach. Uh, and the, the way that we do this is we, we developed um, the low level primitives in Rust for our low level storage layer. And then we design the orchestration of these in Prolog. And when we find a performance bottlenecks, we think about how to press that orchestration or what unit of that orchestration to press down and try to find good sort of boundaries, module boundaries essentially so that we can press it down into Rust to improve performance. And we, we have really been performance driven on this. So the things that get pressed into Rust are those things that need, need performance enhancements. So we started with the storage layer in Rust and have extended this to several like operations that have proved to be slow when they were in Prolog and needed to be faster. Um, so these include things like, uh, you know, uh, patch application and uh, squash operations and things of that nature. So these are larger orchestrated. Uh, they're not as low level, so they, they have logic in them and we're doing it there. Now, we also have done some bulk operations that uh, in, for instance, CSV loading has now been written completely in Rust as well. And this, uh, because if you have hundreds of thousands of rows in your CSV, uh, you get we get probably about a 10 to 20 times speed up from going from Prolog to Rust if we're using the same algorithm, because there's some kind of constant time uh, that you can imagine it, expanding out the, the, the cost of these operations. And for hundreds of thousands of lines, that becomes a really significant time sink. So CSV load has now been moved completely into Rust, and we imagine similar kinds of large-scale bulk operations will all have to be moved into Rust eventually. So um, the, there are some uh, features that we know are we're going to add directly to the Rust library. So we have specific feature enhancements that we are never going to even bother trying to do in Prolog. They generally have to do with low-level manipulation. There's just, it, it would be silly to write them. There's no point in prototyping them even there. However, there's a lot of features that we expect will end up in Rust as we move forward. And they really, it's going to be a slow replacement strategy. And it's not clear that we will ever replace all of Prolog, although we may. Uh, but there's like, even I think in the in the uh, asymptotic future where, you know, this, this product is extremely uh, well developed um, 10 years from now and, and, and very solid, uh, we can imagine that probably some of the schema checking, et cetera, will be done in Prolog, even, even though it will be perhaps Prolog embedded in Rust or using Scryer Prolog or something along those lines. So one of the things, though, that we, we uh, ran into is a sort of unexpected bonus. And we kind of knew this was here, but are amazingly impressed with it. Nevertheless, so this is the unexpected bonus round. So we got data parallelism uh, from switching to Rust and it, at a very low cost using Rayon, and it really blew our minds because we had things we hardly changed at all. We had the logic already written there, and we just used these magic incantations into par iter, par bridge, par sort unstable, and suddenly everything is way, way faster. And uh, we didn't have to think about it that hard. <laughs> we, uh, and I love that because I'm lazy. So anything that, that can reduce the amount of time that we spend writing things while also improving performance is just a huge win. And I, have, I, I cannot 
uh, impress upon people enough how awesome this is and how much we need other people to start using it. So the borrow checker, uh, you know, there's a cost to the programmer, but there's huge benefits that come from it. Uh, and it's not just safety, it's also potentially speed. So if you're interested in an open source solution to collaborative revision control for graphs or complex data sets, you should give TerminusDB a try. And that's it. Well, thank you so much for the talk. It was uh, very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, thank let you. me check the chat. I don't think there's uh, open questions yet, but we have a well, I have, uh, have help from Stefan to ask a question. Do you always build with release mode or is there a speed up with debug mode also a good enough speed up? So, <laughs> no, debug is definitely not uh, fast enough. Well, I mean, it is fast enough. It's fast enough when we're just testing out things. And it's great sometimes to be able to use a debugger or something, but like an actual uh, general use, also while we're developing and when we're not developing the low-level uh, library, we definitely build in release mode always. And yeah. it is a tremendous speed up between them. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. I see like a lot of clapping hands in the chat right now. So thank you so much for the uh, for joining in. Uh, Matthijs, is there like a last thing that you would like to add? Because we have a few minutes uh, also still left. For the talk? Oh, wow, no. <laughs> I had not prepared <laughs> anything for that. Uh, no. Uh, People should try Rayon, I think, is uh, definitely one yes, thing. That Ray we... Rayon was a great uh, thing to try. Like, we were a bit scared to try it because, ooh, data parallelism, uh, scary. But it, it's literally just replacing a few calls and it just works. And we got so much speed out of it. So, yeah, that's. Rust uh, ecosystem is just amazing. We we love it. Well, there's a very like warming community, I have to say, also. It is. It's really uh, great. It's a good community. I think if there's not any questions, can I ask you? Oh, wait, I see a question popping. Do you have any idea what hinders productivity in Rust besides the borrow checker? Well, like, I mean, it's a, it, it types just to introduce extra overhead. And like in Prolog, you have you don't have to worry about garbage collection. You don't have to worry about uh, how you allocate things. You just have fewer things to worry about. And that costs you later. It costs you in terms of performance, but it's really helpful in terms of developer time. And lots of things, it doesn't matter really what the constant time cost is because the, you know it's just glue. Like most software mm -hmm. is just glue code. So, uh, and if you're just writing glue, you don't want to be worried about lots of details i think you know so there's there's another thing here uh which is uh to compare with prolog in prolog you would generally have a running prolog instance with all your code with your entire server running in there and then you do like live recompilation of parts of that program so it's a very short loop between actually writing your code and seeing it in action uh with rust you do have like you have to compile and then you can run your unit test and i mean it's 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 not a big thing but it is a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, so having that kind of uh, REPL experience, that that really does help uh, development. Well, thank you. I think you see some uh, questions popping up also, like for use cases and what kind of applications already use already Terminus DB at the moment. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. So there's sort of like um, oh. machine learning uh, where you're trying to do where you need to have revision control of your data sets, and nice. there's um, any kind of like large scale graph. Uh, manipulation problems, or if you want to, uh, if you if you want to keep revisions and and be able to pipeline your data, that's that's where we would use it. And we scale up to quite large graphs, so you'd be able to stick something large in there if you'd like. Okay, and, um, well, I think we're running sort of out of time. I see like both of messages popping up. Uh, will you both be active in the chat still for to hang around for so answer some questions? I see already, Matthijs. You're finally in the chat as well, so yeah, great. <laughs> we have some technical difficulties sometimes, which one does with this online uh, experience, I would say. Although it's, it's also a kind of fun uh, experience until now, I have to say. Um, yeah, I want to thank you both so much for your time and also the interesting presentation. And please do check out the chat. Um, and then I see that in eight minutes we will start the new uh the next speaker already so that will be interesting as well so please also for the people watching the live stream stick around for that so we'll be back in well eight minutes i would say and thank you so much again uh kevin and matthijs um, great thanks for and see us. you in the chat thank you for having Bye. us and looking forward Bye. to the rest of the talks
Ciao. Bye bye. bye.